I'm here to talk about rankings. I guess all of you are living with rankings the way I am. Your sittings are ranked, your countries are ranked, your schools, like ours, they're ranked over and over again. Hospitals are ranked, and various institutions that we rely on are ranked. It affects us as the ranked, but also we use these devices to think about the world. So, I will tell this, my story about rankings through my personal uh, relation to rankings. We start pretty about 37 years ago, an interaction that I think all of us share. So, well, I asked my mom to dig this up in her grades archives. She kept, keeps the pride of the family, the good grades. She kind of get rid, gets rid of the rest of them. So this is an example of one of them. I don't know whether you see the details, but I looked back at it as an exam, early example of a ranking. It's a fascinating device. So you have a semester over semester. Sorry, could we get, go back? Semester over semester evolution of me. So you can compare me to three months ago. You can compare between different topics. You can compare between different years. And then there are rankings in the class to compare between different students. So there is an all-around numerical system that traces me throughout my life. So this is essentially the emotional map of my childhood. I had keen parents and would run to get these great rights. And then there was also moments of pride and there were moments of shame. And I want to share with you a nightmare that was kind of influential in my life and that takes us to a horse. So why do I show you a horse? Because the night that I had a I think 14 or 13 out of a 20 grade on English language, I had a nightmare inspired by a Japanese film that I've seen, a practice called iron branding, which is essentially marking the horse, which is a piece of metal that's very hot, to give it a label that will stick in a stay. Well, my nightmare was that my English language grade was iron branded on my body. And this metaphor was important because well, number one, how do you heat up the numbers so that they stick to the identity and the body of a child and also of organizations, the way we see them affected by rankings all the time, by comparing. So the moment that you put two numbers side by side and compare them, you heat up the numbers, you make them matter, you make them impactful, and you make them stick. The second thing is that they're sticky. So these grades are important labels that connect us. For example, you can become a bad student, a bad school, a shitty country through these devices. You become part of a shitty country's community or a bad student's group of people. So these relations that these devices create makes it very difficult to move out of that group. So essentially, they make you, structure you, more than they describe you. This takes me to the next stage of my life with rankings. So, adolescent, starting to read the news, every week or so, there is another ranking that comes out that essentially takes me, tells me that, hey, you know what? Your country is shit. I'm sorry to use that term, but that's essentially how it feels, ranking after ranking. So, ranking of democracy, ranking of, well, gender equality, ranking of transparency and corruption, ranking of even happiness. So we are told over and over again every two years that we are sad, and that, that takes us to the next graph. So this is the graph of a graph of, of a ranking of happiness. Typically, the rankings that I've seen over and over again, and I'm not alone, all of us live with rankings of our communities and our, of, our, of our countries. We see the usual suspects, Scandinavian countries on top, then we see Western countries follow, then we see the rest of the world who are the unhappy and the corrupt, and on and on. So I learned with time that the reason that it seemed like my country is in such a state of constant disaster through these rankings is simply because it comes maybe from a different... Maybe we have lots of problems, of course, but also these rankings come from a different value system, maybe a little bit of different idea of happiness. And uh, because I didn't feel sad at the time, neither my family, neither my friends, neither my community. So this is the coverage of this ranking. So we were number 117. So in the next slide, what we see is that this is the news coverage. So this is one media outlet saying that, hey, the Norwegians are the happiest people in the world, the Iranians are 108, and African people are the saddest in the world. 
and they put up a photo of two happy blondes with a working hat as an image of happiness. And that image sticks. Well, okay, over there they're happy, they laugh, and it seems like we don't laugh enough. We did, actually. So, on the right side, it says, the Finns are the happiest in the world. Iran is even sadder than Palestine and Lebanon. So those are the references, it seems like, of sadness somehow for this news outlet. And this is an image of happiness in Finland. They have fireworks, which sounds cheesy, but anyway. So this shows how this affects us, and this creates debates. What's important is we always use the number. We never, never question the method. You never question the organization behind it. The language is an independent organization, or an international organization has told us that we are such and such type of people, but we never look at the backstage of these devices. And that takes me to another example. The Global Gender Report. This uh, ranking of the world economic. <laughs> so we historically never questioned it, because it's always said we are among the maybe 140th, 130th, we are at the bottom, and we are used to it. So as you can see here, this is the ranking from 2014. Iran is 137. But this time, something happened. Saudi Arabia was 130th. And given the special relations that the two countries have at this point in time, there were lots of debate in the media, how can we be worse than Saudi Arabia? Especially, women in Iran fight for freedom. They're very present in all professions that you can imagine, in the parliament and as ministers and on and on. And so women got pissed off that why are we, after all, in all of these rankings, including this one, so all constantly at the bottom? So for the first time, the methodology became a problem. So in the next slide, we see that. So they question the indicators. This is one indicator that looks at enrollment in primary education. What we see in column two is female enrollment. In column three, male enrollment. They divide the two, they come up with a ratio, they rank based on that. What we see is, for example, the country that we discussed, Saudi Arabia, they're 98 and 95 for female and male, according to their reporting. You divide them up, you end up with 1.03. For Denmark, well, it was so reassuring to see Denmark down there for the, for the first time. They're full parity, 98 and 98. So they get a ratio of 1.01. They rank 37th. And Iran, you can see at the bottom on the other side, it's 96 and 98 for a ratio of 0 0.98. It's number 108. So, what I, so when I saw this, I thought, well, this shows sometimes the differences are meaningless, but the ranking needs to rank. So I learned that the ranking, besides the underlying thing that it captures, it needs to squeeze difference out of the data to show difference, otherwise rankings are meaningless. So, after this, what happened was that, guess what? I did something that many of you here are doing. I did an MBA in Canada at Schulich. In a pretty ad hoc way, I ended up being hired in a company that developed rankings. So, <laughs> environmental, social, and governance rankings. So, I ended up being behind the development or in an advisory position for lots and lots of rankings. So as you can see in this slide, I was involved in rankings in access to healthcare. I had involvement advisory role for access to nutrition rankings of large nutrition companies, also rankings of sovereign wealth funds, also rankings related to uh, aid transparency, and on and on. It was a fascinating place to be. So all of a sudden, I see what's behind the scenes of these devices that's been, in many ways, sometimes frustrating me, sometimes fascinating me over the years. My observation was that, number one, how fragile we were, or the teams that I was working with. Normally, these rankings are developed increasingly in the private sector, I mean non-state space. Small teams of young analysts and small organizations are behind them. The implication is that they're prone to intimidation, because they're dealing with large organizations that they want to influence, and they're dealing with very contest contested and hot issues. So they're prone to disappearing. So many rankings disappear, and we forget about them, simply because these are fragile private regulatory devices. Another thing that I observed was how much ad hoc power we had. So as 
the head of a small team for one of these projects and in an advisory position, you could change indicators. And if it's a successful ranking, large organizations will move. The definition of education could be affected by what we did. The definition of access to health could be changed by what we did. Who were we to do this? What is our legitimacy? Why are we qualified to do this? I'll get 30 seconds more. <laughs> so, The next stage in the story is, we move on <coughs> to academia. I become an academic. I do a PhD, 2011. I become a professor. I become a professor in accounting. I do social studies of accounting, the effect of accounting on society, including ranking type devices. With a colleague from King's College, Rita Samiolo, we do lots of studies on these rankings I've been involved in, but also new rankings. But also, Another fascinating realization for me is, hey, I'm back to where I was at the age of six and a half. Essentially, I'm in a hyper-ranked sector and hyper-ranked organization where everybody is obsessed with ranking, including you students, many of you who are studying here or have been studying here, but also Dean, all this, this institution, but we are not alone, all the schools in the sector. They're constantly talking and caring about their ranking. The journals that we publish in are affected by rankings. Many schools' strategy is fully outsourced to these rankings and what type of a strategy will improve their ranking. So who does, for example, our own ranking, the FT Business School's ranking? It's a few staff at the FT offices. They're defining essentially what business education is about, mostly along market-based criteria. So <coughs> the other thing that I learned was that, seeing it from within the organizations, I felt like we were getting iron branded again. So I felt like these devices have the power to mark us, to put sticks on us that are very difficult to wipe off, that structure us in fundamental ways. To summarize, I, wanted, I want you maybe to leave with a few points. Number one, rankings are there to stay. They're powerful for reasons. Number one, we're increasingly needing to decide at a distance. Politicians, individuals, organizations. And quantified information makes it easy to decide at a distance. Number two, they simplify the world. And simplification is an important demand from organizations and from individuals. And number three, the drive on the back of the excitement of winning and losing, the media love that, different stakeholders like that, and the winners in the game love that. And the collective power of these actors and their demand and pool will make ranking intensify and expand over the years. So I want to summarize with these four ideas about the effects of rankings on, especially how they're produced on matters of public interest. Number one, rankings a lot of them de-democratize governance of public goods. What does that mean? They move where the idea of education, healthcare, nutrition are defined from public arenas to private arenas. They can do multi-stakeholder consultation and various things. Some of them do regardless. They run the game in the private sector and very small organizations of what are our public goods and how they should be managed. Number two. They westernize public goods. So ranking is part of an interesting phenomenon where governance is moving from intergovernmental organizations, a lot of it, that is member funded, to private organizations that are donor funded. And donors are dominantly Western. And organizations who rank by extension are dominantly Western. And they bring Western definitions of public goods throughout the world. Number three is that rankings are fragile devices because they're done a lot of times, especially when they're done but with not-for-profit organizations or private entities, but very small teams, badly funded organizations. The implication is that they can be easily intimidated, but also they can easily disappear. What does it tell us about how we are regulating our public goods? And number four, rankings are spectacles in the sense that they have to appeal to their various audiences and they have to manage the complex politics of the field coming from a weak position, at least at the, in the first few years. So there is a tension always between what you capture 
and what kind of representation of data, what kind of variability. Whether you should be stable over the years, but with some change to create news. You should be consistent with people's intuition so that they take it to be good quality, but have some counterintuitive information to generate news. All of these attributes drive how rankings look like. With that, well, all of this was kind of maybe a, a critique so far of my life how and how it was affected by rankings. I want to go away with some three ideas about how we can now live with them. The first idea that's being pitched a lot by some of my colleagues is maybe we need alternative rankings. If we start doing rankings of loneliness, rankings of generosity and homelessness in cities, for example, maybe we, if we look at schools with a very different set of criteria, that look at connectedness to the local community, relevance of research for the local communities, then we will end up with very different alternative rankings. They will, this will reinforce the quantification paradigm, but at least provide alternative value sets. The second thing that is why I'm doing this talk here today is the idea that let's foreground the hidden, the essentially the, the skeletons in the closet, the methodologies, politicize them, make rankings debatable. They're too rarefied, they're too solid. Let's make them stutter, and let's make them, make them questionable. And the third one is, let's think of alternative ways of knowing. If you're managing a school, if you're managing any type of initiative and an entity, there are so many possibilities also, especially with technology, to enable people exper experiencing an organization that can be an addendum, complementary, two various types of ranking devices to tame their effect so that they don't dominate the paradigm of knowing from a distance. Thank you very much. <laughs>